And the great irony is, um, in order to become the people that God created us and calls us to be, we have to be willing to move towards the pain that we have been wanting to avoid. Mm -hmm. And that invitation isn't necessarily an invitation that we desire. Nobody wants to move towards pain. And so the idea isn't that Jesus will rescue us from our pain, but the comfort is that Jesus will be with us in the pain. Yeah. That this is a journey that we can undertake, and the good news is we don't have to go it alone, that, that God will be with us as we move through. And the ideas we move towards, we move through, we move beyond yeah. the pain. True podcast. We're back with you today uh, again with our special guest, the clinical director of Faithful and True, Jim Farm. Jim, how are you today? Excellent. I, I love being with you guys on this format, so yeah. I'm excited. Well, Greg and I uh, really enjoy having you uh, as our uh, our guest on the show, and our listeners do too. We get great feedback on that. And uh, our host, Dr. Greg Miller, how are you doing today, Greg? I am doing well and also glad to be here. Oh, that's great. Well, listen, we had a wonderful podcast last week, and we uh, decided to invite Jim to come back again uh, and uh, continue a conversation. And and what's the angle that you're going to approach this time, Greg? Well, what we want to do is kind of um, expand and understand this idea of recovery. You know, that we hear it in a variety of different um, concepts and ideas, and we talk specifically about recovery from sex addiction or recovery from addiction in general. But we recognize that for all of us, there's some aspect of recovery um, that is a part of our life, it is a part of our journey. Um, so to begin with, I think it's helpful to just talk about the, the terminology. So when we talk about addiction, we talk about addiction occurs anytime you're trying to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way in a repetitive pattern. And recovery is when we identify the legitimate need and meet it legitimately. And we expand that to say recovery is the journey of becoming the person that God created you to be. And so it's not just about giving up a behavior or changing one aspect of who I am, but it really is about engaging this journey so that I can become fully the person that God intends for me to be. Yeah, I agree with you, Greg. I, I think, you know, if, if people just have the limited definition that recovery is recovery from addiction or recovery from betrayal or recovery from abuse, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't feel all that hopeful. Mm -hmm. But when you think about, you know, what about beyond that? Am I recovering these components of myself that God really designed within me? That's a little bit more hopeful way of approaching recovery. Yeah, and maybe another word would be to reclaim. Yeah. That there, there is a truth of who I am. And we often encourage the men who come to the workshop and also for the women who participate in the women's workshop that is about reclaiming our truth, reclaiming our belovedness. And we live in a world, a culture, a life that robs us of that truth, that actually just takes that away from us. And it's in the, the lies and the deception that we experience so much chaos. But when we begin to reclaim the truth of who God is, to reclaim the truth of who we are, we experience that promise that the truth will set us free. And I do think there's something sad and disappointing. You know, we have men who come to the workshop and their, their vision is simply to give up this behavior. Mm -hmm. And it's like that is far as they can see or that's as much as they can understand. But that is so limited in, in not becoming fully this person that God has us to be, but also the promises and the offerings that God has for us. Yeah. And I think the, the, the same is true for, for the women and the, the wives that choose to, to enter into recovery from the betrayal with mm -hmm. us as well is you know, there's a sense that, you know, I don't want to be here. It's not my issue. It's unfair. Mm -hmm. And some of those things are actually true, but it is an invitation to actually start to on their own recovery. Because I believe all of us are in recovery. Mm -hmm. We've all been impacted by life, you know, and, and parts of ourself may have been distorted or disturbed as a result. So I think all of us are in a place of, of recovery, regardless if we've had addiction in our history or not. Yeah. And you know, what, what is we, we often hear this specifically from couples that have been doing the work of recovery, 
is they will talk about the fact that they don't want to go back to the old marriage. So this is not recovering something that was. It is about reclaiming something that is. It is about moving towards something that maybe we've never fully experienced. It's, it's reclaiming that which was lost. And so as we talk about this idea of recovery, it's not about looking at the past and trying to recreate something in its best form now, mm -hmm. but it really is about looking towards the future to see what is possible if I'm on this journey of becoming the person that God created me to be. Mm -hmm. And so part of, part of that process is starting to, you know, to recognize you know, how has life impacted me because then I start to get into touch with um, maybe the parts of myself that maybe I've lost touch with. Mm -hmm. You know, and it starts to give me maybe a, a pathway of, of where am I, where am I going with this recovery? Yeah, you know, uh, the therapist that I see talks about the exiled parts of us, mm -hmm. and what's true is there are parts of us that, when we were young, either created chaos for us or weren't accepted or weren't welcomed or, um, we didn't see the value of them, and so there are these parts of us that are exiled. And part of recovery is reclaiming those yeah. and understanding who they are in our lives and what voices have been lost that we need to listen to. And if we understand that God created us with this intention, you know, yeah. I often talk about the fact that the scripture says that we were knitted together in our mother's womb. And that Hebrew word knitted there is a word for intentional craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. So there is a purposefulness in our creation. So there's a strategy, there's a plan, there's a vision, there's a desire. And so recovery is about understanding that from the very beginning, there was intentionality around who I am. And some of the chaos that I've experienced has caused me to lose that. I've, I've gotten lost. Yeah. And so it's about finding my way forward, given the truth of who God is. Yeah. Yeah, and I always, for, for my vision for that, I always kind of go back to, uh, you know, the story of, 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 you know, of Jesus when he's preaching and is, is telling the 12 disciples as the little kids are kind of running up to him, right? I always kind of have this vision of the common day church where the pastor's about ready to preach and, you know, the board of elders are shooing away the kids, mm -hmm. you know? But Jesus says, wait a minute, you know, unless you come to me as one of these, you know? And I always kind of struggled with that because I was like, well, I don't really want to go back to childhood. You know what I mean? But really, I think what Jesus is saying there is unless you come to me in this very authentic, humble way, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what I kind of envision as recovery, you know, is, is you know, re reclaiming, I'll use mm -hmm. your word, reclaiming that part of myself. You know, because if you think about it as a child, you know, some people can remember this, some people can't, but I don't know if you remember a time when you were a kid where... You just kind of said what you said, you did what you did, and you really didn't have any self-consciousness. So innocent, <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and I'm not saying we go back necessarily to that childlike state, but I am saying that you know, I think what we are trying to reclaim is that authentic part of ourselves. Yeah. Well, and even in the language of counseling, you hear this idea of the inner child. Yeah. And I actually think that that's a theological term. We, we talk about this idea of the three chairs as a motivation that in each of us, there's this wise adult, there's these survivor strategies, and then there's this little boy or little girl part of us. And for some people, they believe that the goal is to get rid of the little boy or the little girl because they perceive that as the immature part of who they are. Mm -hmm. But the reality is the way that we talk about it here, that child part of us is the innocent and naive Pure. part of who we are. Yeah, that's right. It is the trusting part of who we are. Um, it is the needful part of who we are. And so it's also that vulnerable part of who we are. That's right. And so I think that you mentioned this idea of children being free and not having filters. It's the authentic part of who we are. Yeah. And so when we are able to move to our faith and experience Jesus from that childlike part of us, that's when we experience transformation. And for many of us, we struggle connecting to God because our strategies have always been from that survivor. It's about performance. It's about my identity. It's about knowledge, knowing the right things. And what we know experientially is that's never satisfying. But it's that innocent, naive, trusting, needful part of us when we bring that to Jesus and bring that literally to Jesus' lap 
Yeah. That's where we experience transformation. That's right. That's right. Because remember, Jesus' response to the little children was compassion. Mm -hmm. Right. And that you make a good point about acceptance of that vulnerable part of ourself. I think that's also true of that survivor part of ourself. Mm -hmm. Is, you know, it's just not a bad part of ourselves. But when that part shows up, it's, it's usually indicating that there's a hurting part. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I, I would even say, this idea that um, the goal is not to get rid of that survivor. Yeah. In fact, if, if we hadn't had some of those survival strategies as children, we wouldn't have made it. The goal is to be so strong in our wise adult that the child part of us is safe and those survival strategies are no longer needed. Yeah. Um, and, and we're able to move towards others and towards ourselves in that wise adult place with the innocence and trust of that little child as we bring that. It, the kind of the image is the wise adult part of us has the hand of that young child of us and brings that to the feet of Jesus. That's right. Um, well, let's talk a little bit um, about this idea of recovering from something. Um, obviously, in the work that we do, we are working with men, women, couples that have been impacted significantly from sexual addiction. So we're wanting to recover from the chaos, the addiction, the destruction that that has uh, created. But what are some other things that you hear in working with people that I am recovering from? Yeah, it's actually one of the more fun things that, that I work with people on because um, it, it's things that I believe, I believe some of the, their greatest gifts somehow got distorted. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, I'll give you an example. We work with a lot of senior pastors, at least I do clinically. And so they tend to be really good leaders, you know. Um, but for a lot of those guys, you know, at, at some point, maybe their, their use of authority, you know, got distorted. Mm -hmm. And so they use their authority in ways that maybe serve them than serve others. But at their true heart, they do desire to serve others. Right. You know, and so part of that is understanding how did that get distorted, this, this compassion, but also this leadership, this ability to influence others. And so we start to process, what does that look like to recover that? Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, using my authority, my leadership to empower others rather than try to heal something in myself where I have to regain some power. So that'd be one example. I, I think that's a great example. And, you know, we work with men who are creative, and using that same language, their creativity got hijacked by this survivor part of them. And they use their creativity to deceive, to hide, to lie, to distract. And so as they are doing their work in recovery, they discover that they can reclaim that creative part of them and use it for redemptive purposes. And maybe the, the thing to understand is, what I need to focus on are what are the things in my life that limit me from becoming the man that God created me to be or limit me from becoming the woman that God created me to be. And we can more easily identify some of those. Obviously, addiction is one of them. Mm -hmm. But what's also true is um, uh, uh, unexpressed or out-of-control anger can be some, something that limits me from becoming the person that God created me to be. Um, resentment can be that thing that keeps me from becoming the person God wants me to be. So it's actually this greater invitation, and that's mm. maybe the best thing to understand, that recovery is an invitation, yeah. you know, and it's not just a, a punishment where you have to give up something. It's the invitation to something new that God is wanting to do in our lives as we become the person that we were created to be. That's right. That's the exciting part of it. I would also say, you know, some of those things that you listed, there's also things that actually look good on the outside, mm -hmm. like people pleasing, for example. That would be one of those protective strategies. Right. You know, that's um, maybe protecting, I'll use your term, one of those exiles of maybe being rejected. So I'm, people, I'm using people pleasing to deal with, you know, my, my controlling this, this whole outcome of not wanting to be rejected. Yeah, another example of that would be passivity or withdrawal, where I've learned to cope by being silent, by being passive. And I may present myself as being respectful or um, cautious, or I may be able to, to try to present it in a more positive way, but by being 
absent from my own life, by being passive, by not moving towards the things I believe God is calling me towards, I'm not living the life that God created me to have. And so it is interesting how we can package certain things and try to present them in an acceptable way, but at the root of them, they are a survival strategy that's keeping us from being fully who God wants us to be. Yeah, yeah. And one of, one of the ways that we'll know maybe we're in one of those protective strategies is, am I trying to manage outcomes? Mm. You know, am I trying to manage a, an outcome of a situation? Because whenever we're moving away from this vulnerability, which I think is, you know, when we're in touch with our vulnerabilities and, you know, respond to those really intentionally, I'll use that, your word again, I think we're in that authentic place. But when I'm trying to manage outcomes, I'm trying to manage your perception of me, you know, then I have to really pay attention to, hey, I think I'm, I'm, you know, trying to deal with something here. And I'm not in this place of, of authenticity, mm-hmm. which I, I think is what we're after in terms of recovery. And, you know, one, one of the things I think may be helpful is understanding one of the things that may be true is we are trying to recover from a circumstance. Mm-hmm. Um, the other piece of it is we are trying to recover from the consequences and the implications of a circumstance. Mm -hmm. And so there are times when um, we have a very painful, difficult thing happen to us. And, you know, again, with the population that we work with, there are a lot of um, women especially that are trying to recover from the chaos and the pain that they are experiencing from the circumstance of their husband's addiction. That's right. And we have a lot of men who have had significant consequences and they're trying to recover. Mm-hmm. You know, I love the imagery of kind of recovery from a storm. And mm-hmm. you know, my life exploded about the same time that Hurricane Katrina came through New Orleans. So as I, my life was in disarray, so was this entire city. And I remember listening to the, as I was driving to my therapist or my recovery group or whatever it was, And the reality of it was the destruction that the storm created was so significant that you had to make the choice to stay and to recover, you know. Mm -hmm. You had to reclaim all that was lost. Mm -hmm. And that can be true for people. If a storm has come through your life, there are some things that will need to be reclaimed. The second part of that is, let's say I stay after the storm and I repair my house and I get it back to being inhabitable. But there are consequences that I internalize from the storm, and I also need to pay attention to those too. Because some things can be lost in the storm that are internal. Maybe I lose my hope, I lose my joy, I lose my peace, and I do have to reclaim those. I do have to recover those, um, not letting the storm win in that particular case. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. Another example of what you're speaking to is, you know, when I'm working with folks around sexual abuse, for example, I think one of the things that does get lost in that process, you're recovering from the the impact of the abuse, but one of the things I think also that you're recovering is this sense of being able to experience the joy of giving and receiving within the sexual interaction, Mm -hmm. which I think gets lost within the abuse because it's was obligated touch. Right. You know, so I think that kind of touches is an example of that maybe. Yeah, and one of the complexities is the loss many times is not easily discernible at the beginning because the loss plays out over time. And it doesn't matter what the loss is. You know, I once had a professor say wherever there's loss there's grief, and the greater the loss the greater the grief. Mm-hmm. And when we begin to understand our lives in the sense of what what has been lost Well, sometimes we have a sense initially of things that were lost, but sometimes it takes time to begin to see the full implications that this one experience I had when I was a child is currently having on me. And this idea of awakening to that reality, acknowledging that loss, and once again, each time I become aware of that loss, choosing not to be defined by it. Um, Part of my story is I also experienced sexual abuse. So I recognized early on some of the implications of it, but it's been a journey, it's been a lifetime to see how those experiences from my adolescent continue to have implications now. The good news is I don't have to be defined by those. Mm -hmm. You know, in our previous podcast, I talked about this idea that we can be victimized and that doesn't mean that I'm a victim. 
Victimization is something that happens to me. Victim is some, uh, becoming a victim is when I allow what happens to me to define me. It becomes my value, my identity. And as we said in the last podcast, once I allow myself to become a victim, then that opens that door to entitlement. Well, I deserve these things because of what has happened to me. And so we never want to be defined by what has happened. And we also want to understand the significance of what has happened so that we can grieve that loss and move forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that process, Greg, I think it's, it's important that it does take time because you can mm -hmm. imagine if you, yeah. if you discovered all that at once, it'd be way too overwhelming. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so oftentimes, you know, I often think of clients that come in and say, all right, I'm going to see you, you know, five times a week and we'll be done in a month. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, how long is this going to take? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it, it's important to recognize we, we want to be able to um, allow that process to take some time. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm a basketball guy, so I don't know. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so John Wooden, the great coach, often would say, you know, if, if you quicken the process, you cheapen the result. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and I, I think that's a, uh, I, I love that line just because I think that's true in recovery. Yeah. Well, y'all know me, you know, I love my metaphors and my images. And one of the images that I use is the image of like a knee replacement surgery. And so what happens is we are in pain. Um, I'm using my dad's example without his permission, but so my dad had knee replacement surgery. And um, in fact, he had both of his knees done. And prior to the surgery, he was in pain. And the pain was significant. The doctor basically said it's bone on bone mm -hmm. and you need the surgery. So he has the surgery and he's still in pain. And so the surgery creates pain. And then he has to go to rehab and the rehab creates pain. Mm -hmm. Then he has to do exercises and the exercises create pain. But the difference before and after surgery is the pain after surgery is leading to healing. Yeah. The pain before the surgery was just perpetuating the pain. He continued to be held hostage by the pain. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that recovery will involve moving towards our pain. Yeah. And that's probably something that we need to acknowledge. That we have this image, this hope, this thought, this wishful thinking, that if I choose recovery, then re it will help me avoid my pain. Mm -hmm. But actually recovery is choosing to move towards the pain so that I won't be defined by the pain or held hostage by the pain. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, Greg. I've always kind of said, you know, recovery is one of the most courageous things you can do because you almost repeatedly have to enter into pain, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's, um, it is, I, I do believe that it's a courageous thing. And I, it's just not for addiction. Like I said, I think for every one of us, there's, a, there's an aspect of recovery where we have to be willing to enter into that pain. And, and the great irony is, um, in order to become the people that God created us and calls us to be, we have to be willing to move towards the pain that we have been wanting to avoid. Mm -hmm. And that invitation isn't necessarily an invitation that we desire. Nobody wants to move towards pain. And so the idea isn't that Jesus will rescue us from our pain, but the comfort is that Jesus will be with us in the pain, yeah. that this is a journey that we can undertake, and the good news is we don't have to go it alone, that, that God will be with us as we move through. And the idea is we move towards, we move through, we move beyond yeah. the pain. Yeah. I, I, one, you know, one of my favorite things is, you know, sayings of Jesus and God, fa the Father is, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Mm -hmm. you know, I know you went to seminary, and the, the Greek, right, often has much more, much more meaning than the English. But that word never mm -hmm. literally means never, Greek or English. Right. right. You know, there was no asterisk unless you did this or unless this happened to you. It was never is never, mm -hmm. you know. And so, yeah, exactly what you're saying is enter into that pain, recognizing he will never leave us nor yeah. forsake us. And, and this idea of choosing it, you know, that recovery is something that we choose and we have to choose it because there will be a part of us that is oppositional to it. There will be a part of us that is resistant to us, you know. And part of the way that God created us is we were born to be pain avoidant. Mm -hmm. Because if there's too much pain, it will destroy us. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not careful, we have this part of us that is pain avoidant. We live in a culture that tells us that we should be pain avoidant. 
In fact, I、um, spoke at a seminary and I was talking about kind of what are the attributes of an addictive culture. And the first thing that I mentioned was a culture becomes addictive when it begins to promise the people that pain can be avoided. Because as soon as I believe that pain can be avoided, then I have to have a strategy to avoid the pain. And that's where the addictions come in. So even as I'm thinking about this idea of recovery, whatever it may be in my life, reclaiming something or getting free from something, if I understand it in the fuller context of this is the journey of becoming the person that God created me to be, which means I'm walking away from those things that limit me from becoming that person. It's about engaging the pain to move beyond it.、Mm-hmm. Well, go ahead. Well, that's right, Greg. And I, I think what you spoke to there is, you know, what's the vision?、Mm-hmm. You know, why am I going to enter into this pain? You know, what's the vision that I'm moving towards if I make that choice? Without that vision, I think all of us would like be running in the opposite direction.、Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And one more thing, I know we're about out of time. <laughs> Thank you. The the hope. And the promise is, and we are not alone. We can do this in community. One of my favorite images of the body of Christ is the caravan of faith, that we are traveling together, and that in those moments of difficulty and pain, we don't have to be alone. And one of the foundational principles of recovery is about engaging community in an authentic way. And we spend a lot of time talking about it here at Faithful and True. But the bottom line is, if I want to do recovery, I cannot do it alone.、Mm-hmm. And if my strategy is I'm going to do recovery and I'm going to do it alone, I'm guaranteed that I won't be successful because、yeah. the community is a part of the process itself.、Mm-hmm. Which brings me to one of my favorite、uh, sayings that、uh, Dr. Mark Laser, our founder, would always say, and、oh, many times in the workshop too, when you take all of this into account. Then you also remember that there's no sin that God is unwilling to forgive.、Yeah. All of a sudden, we you feel empowered、mm-hmm. to to want to face that pain、mm-hmm. and and to、uh, enter that recovery. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'd like to thank you for joining us today again on the Faithful and True podcast. Again, it's been a joy to have Jim Farm with us together, of course, with our host, Dr. Greg Miller. We hope that today's message has been beneficial to you.、Uh, for more resources and information about Faithful and True, we invite you to visit our website, faithfulandtrue.com. You'll find、uh, all the information about our three-day intensive workshops, the Men of Valor workshop we do every month. We're back to doing it in person, which we're quite excited about. So check that out. You'll be able to register right online. And、uh, the same goes for the women's workshop and the couples workshop.、Uh, they will be coming up later this fall, but、uh, information is available on the on the、uh, website.、Uh, together with all of these podcasts, we have both audio and video podcasts available for you、uh, to to watch or listen to.、Uh, until we join you again next week, we'd like to wish you a, a great week—a week that's filled with many blessings and with great vision. <laughs>